And I want to encourage you and give this disclaimer always, that we are not looking at the book of Revelation to figure out if we're living in the end of time, all right? That's not the point. Because Revelation 1.1 says it is the revelation of Jesus, all right? So I want, if this is your first time hearing me, and if this is not, I want that in your heads. This is the revelation of Jesus. And our biggest goal, my biggest prayer, and so should yours, would be that the Holy Spirit reveal to us who Jesus is and how to follow him, all right? And especially, everybody here online, my biggest prayer is that the Holy Spirit reveals our massive need for Jesus, and that never goes away. I don't care how many songs you sing, how many times you turn ch attend church, how much you read the Bible, that need for God never, never ends. So we're, right now we're looking at the, we're breaking down the seven letters to the seven churches. Each of these, uh, the book of Revelation was written to these seven literal historical churches during the first century. But what's important, why that matters to us today, is because these seven churches represent seven types of Christians and seven types of churches that exist throughout church period over the last 2,000 years. So you can find yourself in one of these, and that's my prayer as well. And uh, the first church we looked at, I kind of call it the, the priority misplaced church, all right? This is a church that was great, but their priorities weren't in the right order, and they, it wasn't going to last. First things weren't first. Last week, we talked about the persecuted church. What happens when you are on fire for Jesus? Well, you invite a fight. When you're on fire for Jesus, you are inviting a fight from the enemy. But we know that in Christ Jesus, yo, that fight's already over. We're just running out the clock and just scoring, running up the score. That's what that's all about. But today, today, guys, listen. Today, we're going to take a turn. Today, this church, something subtle happens in this church that happened and can and does happen in my life. And I got to be careful. And let me tell you, it happens in your life. And sometimes you don't notice it. Sometimes you kind of play the little game and downplay it. It happens. And so that's why this church has always been labeled, the third church, the compromised church. The compromised church. And so now I don't know about you, but I, we know, and you've heard of the word compromise. Anybody here ever had to compromise on something before? Right? We know that it's a good thing. Maybe it's at your work, your job's like, hey, you know, we compromise with your team, right? Some of you, maybe hey, a relationship is pure compromise, right? Really, especially marriage. Marriage is nothing but continual compromise. Me and my wife, we have a couple compromises. You know, she does all the cooking. I do all the eating and the dishes. I do the dishes. That's my job. All right? She does the cooking. I do the cleaning. I do the dishes. She uh, does the laundry. I help her fold it and especially uh, hang it up on, on the closet, you know, because she's 5'2", and, and I, like an idiot, did my closet myself and made it so high that she can't reach it. So here I am. I'm the dummy now that has to put up all the clothes in the closet. So she does the cooking. I do the dishes. She does the laundry like that. I help her put it all away. She cleans the house, and I follow her like a little puppy, just telling her how beautiful she is the entire time. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm kidding. Trust me. If you've seen the internet, you've seen anything, I help her on the house, so don't, don't play, all right? Y'all know. But listen, we all know that compromise is a good thing, right? Yes or no? Compromise can be a good thing, but can compromise be bad? Yes. Tell me I am not the only one who has ever compromised their values before. Online, don't hide. I know I don't see you. You see me. I don't see you seeing me. Online, I know you've compromised your values before. Anybody here ever done that? You had a moment, and you knew what you were doing, if we're honest with yourselves, right? You compromised your values. You said, look, I'm going to do something which I know is wrong, and I don't care the ramifications if it hurts me or hurts somebody else. I just want to do it. And maybe you, like, lie to yourself, right? You're like, well, it's just one time. It's just a little bit. I'm stressed, right? Whatever excuse you make, you, we, we downplay it, and then we compromise our values. And then... There's that walk of shame, right? Then there's that, oh, what was I thinking, kind of a moment that you kind of have when you realize, dang, that, was, that wasn't worth it. Now, here's the scary thing about compromise, and I know you found yourself here because I have to. Scary about compromising your values in this. The more you do it, the easier it gets, don't it? Right? The more you compromise your values, the easier it gets. When you do it once, it's easy to do it again. If you don't stop it, if you don't own up to it, right? You, the more you do it, the more numb you become, and it becomes easier to do it. And then you find yourself, now, it was just one time. It doesn't happen often. And then you're like, well, you don't, you don't understand. 
And then we, well, it's really not that bad, right? That's what compromise does. We lie to ourselves, and it never ends well. Well, guys, Jesus is calling out a church, a pretty good church for that matter, this third church. He's calling them out, and the main reason why he's calling them out, even though they got a lot of good things going on, he says, hey, I got this one issue. There's a compromise that you are doing, and it's small, but we all know, guys, it just takes a little bit, right, to make a big difference. And so we're going to look at here, and as we look at this third letter to the third church, which is Pergamum, we're going to see and uncover the demonic strategy to get you to self-sabotage your relationship with God. You hear me? This is how you become an accomplice to your own spiritual suicide. This is what happens. All right? He gets you to compromise in the little things to rob you of the big things of God. All right, did I make it interesting enough to be like, okay, I need to figure this out. I don't want that for me. Hopefully I did. Well, here we go. We're going to look at this third church, which is uh, like I pronounced it as Pergamum. One thing that's interesting, guys, about these seven churches, I've been saying this, is that many theologians believe not only do these seven churches represent the types of churches and Christians that exist even today, but you can divide the last 2,000 years of church history into seven ages, into seven periods. And so the first church represented the church from the resurrection to the mid-second century. The second church, that last week we talked about it, the persecuted church, what represents the, uh, the church from the second to fourth century. That one specific church during John's time was persecuted heavily. And we know that the church as a whole for 200 years, prior, around this time for two, 200, second century, fourth, was persecuted violently. But then this church comes around. Pergamum, there's something unique happening in Pergamum during this time when John wrote it that actually characterizes the time period of the church from the 4th century to the 6th. Do you know what happened during the 4th century? Some of y'all know this if you remember history. Constantine became, was the emperor of Rome. Constantine had a vision of the cross, became a Christian, and Rome almost overnight went from persecuting and punishing Christians to promoting the Christian faith. And then now it was the hot ticket, right? It was everything to be a Christian now. I mean, in fact, he imposed it. It was like, that we are now a Christian nation. And so now the persecution was done with. I'm like, hey, we can, it's almost like right now I told you, hey, Corona's dead. You can all go just wild out right now outside. That's kind of that. It went from boom to boom. In that sense. And so here they are. Now Christians don't have to be afraid of going outside and meeting people and saying they're Christians. And theologians and during the time, pastors and, and, and those who studied were able to gather together all the little, the Old Testament scriptures, letters from Paul and Peter and John. And during the 4th and 6th century, guess what we got? This. The Bible was able to be put together and canonized during this time because of the freedom that they existed there was no more pressure no more opposition but as even though the, the lack of pressure was positive the lack of pressure also caused a ch this church and the church as a whole for a time and you and I do this too to kind of like lean back a little bit to relax lay our guard down and begin to compromise the little things so let's check it out let's look at verse of chapter 2 verse Pop it up real quick. Oh, wrong one. Hold on. Verse 2, no, chapter 2, verse 8, 12. Okay, here we go. So let's look at this first word here. Here's how Jesus is addressing the church. Verse 12, write to, he's telling John, write to the angel, the leader of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has a sharp, double-edged sword. I'm going to stop really quick, and I'll come back to that. That image of Jesus with the dark, uh, you know, Sharp, double-edged sword. There we go. All right. Watch this because that's important. It's going to come play out later. This is the same image that John had in verse 1, uh, in chapter 1 of Revelation, when he saw this sword sticking out of Jesus' mouth. So I want you to know what does that mean? The sword represents God's words, okay? It represents God's word. We see that throughout the scriptures that the sword is always representative of the word of God, the sword of the spirit, the spirit of truth. So truth, sword, all of it. That's even God's written word. That's what this means. It's a double-edged sword because every time Jesus talks, he got two things that happen. The double edge of Jesus' sword is grace and truth. Every time Jesus talks, it's grace and truth. You guys ever heard of that term or use the phrase, uh, sometimes the truth hurts? Right? The truth hurts sometimes. Well, sometimes you need a little uh, anesthesia to let the truth hit. Well, that's what grace is. God will speak the truth in love. That's the double edge of the, of the truth of God. So remember this image. We're going to come back to it later, right? Here we go. Look what he says to this church. I know where you live. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. 
Yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death among you where Satan lives. I'm sorry. If I got a message, if I got a text message, an email, if Jesus tagged me in a post and told me, hey, bro, appreciate you, man, all that you're doing, all, you know, you, you representing over there where Satan's throne is in your city where Satan lives, I would be on Zillow immediately after trying to find real estate, somebody else, because like, yo, how come Jesus, how come the devil lives in my city? Like, what's going on? That his throne is there. Like, think that's weird. And then that phrase, what does that mean to have his throne in this city? Well, if you know, when you looked up and I looked up Pergamum, it was interesting. There was two very important thrones in this town. Pergamum had, it was the seat, it was the seat of the Roman government in that province. So think of it like Pergamum kind of was like a capital city where the everything governmental that happened in that region, in that province was in Pergamum. So there was a seat of government there, an important one. But not only that, Pergamum was the center of imperial worship. So Rome was not just happy with having, you know, obedient, uh, obedient subjects. Rome wanted everyone to worship Caesar as God and to worship Rome as God and, and spiritually. This was a big deal. This was governmental imperial worship. And so to me, when, when I was looking at this and like, Lord, what does it mean that a Satan's throne is here? Is well, it reminded me that Satan has a God complex. Satan wants to be God. He wants to rule and wants to have subjects. But unlike God who wants a family, children, sons and daughters, all right, the devil wants slaves, all right? And so, and the devil, and we see it throughout history, he'll use things, you know, like Marxism, communism, and, and that's just not a 200-year thing. That's, you know, we've had tyranny and all that stuff for, since the beginning of time, pretty much. And so the devil loves to use governmental authority, power, people that just love power to control them. And to the devil, he receives that worship. He receives that for himself. Because anything, if he can get people to worship anyone but God, he's successful. He's happy. So to me, the throne of Satan represents that he's getting people to worship government as God. But not only that, there was another throne, which was interesting. There was a massive temple called the Temple of Zeus. Now, Greco-Roman, you know, the, a lot of the Greek culture made its way into Roman culture, even the worship of their gods. So in Pergamum, they had the Temple of Zeus there, and it was this beautiful, massive complex. And there was a throne there that they worshipped Caesar. Now, a lot of the Greek stuff, a lot of the Greek worship guys, listen, I'm going to tell you, it was really perverted. Perverted. They did human sacrifices there, some disgusting things there, and committed some... You know, some sexual things that, look, there are children present, so I'm not going to go there. But y'all can just kind of Google it and figure it out. There was some situations going down in the temple of Zeus. And one of the sacrifices that they would make, which is crazy. People can be twisted, man. They had a bronze bull there. And the bronze bull was hollowed out. And they would take a person, put him inside of the bull, put the head of the person right where the head of the, the mouth was of the bull right there. They would light the bull on fire. The bronze would heat up and would roast the individual inside alive. Now, if that wasn't twisted enough, they actually put a hole inside of the mouth of the bull. And so as the person would writhe and scream in agony, it would shoot out like a megaphone outside of the horn. And it looked like the bull was coming alive. That's some twisted stuff. Some people think that's where maybe where Antipas was murdered. Antipas was that guy that, oh, we don't know much about him other than the fact that Jesus called him my faithful witness. Anybody here would love for Jesus to call you that? If he had one thing to say about you, it would be, yo, my faithful witness right here. That'd be nice. And the word Antipas is interesting because his name means anti-all. He was anti-all of it. Anti the worship of Caesar as God. No, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to worship government as God. I worship the Lord as God. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bow down to, to demonic worship. I'm not going to do and fall into the, the corruption of the culture. I'm not going to do that. He was anti all of it and was murdered for it. So the majority of the church is in the thick of it, in the thick of just power and, and, and corruption and, and just all kinds of wickedness. They're in the middle of it. And Jesus says, you guys are faithful. You guys are hanging in there. You're not denying your faith. I respect. I love you guys. But it didn't end there. Even though the majority of the church was like that, not everybody. Which, by the way, you know what's one interesting fact? You guys know that you can still see the temple of Zeus, the throne of Satan, temple of Zeus. Uh, it's no longer in Pergamum anymore. It was excavated and moved to Germany in the 1930s. 
the Nazis love that so much, which makes sense. Hey, you know, you know what Hitler, you know, Hitler's like, you know what I need? I need the throne of Satan over here. So let's go get it. They got the thing. They brought it over to Nazi Germany in the Pergamum Museum. And you could visit it. Well, not now, actually. It's still there, but they kind of shut it down for like maintenance and things like that. So the German government says that they're going to open it up in uh, 2023. So the way 2020 is going, can we like not expose the throne of Satan to the world? Can we just keep that, you know, put the blanket over that? Just kind of keep it closed for a little bit. I, I think we could survive a couple more years without it. Anyways, but I want you to check this out. Even though this, this church is being faithful, not denying their faith, guys, here's where I would need you to lean in. Because this is where the devil gets us. This is where demons get us all the time. In the small things. Notice what Jesus says in verse 14. I'm going to read verse 14 all the way through 15. But I have a few things. <clears throat> Jesus had only one thing to say to the first church. Nothing to say to the second church. The third one's like, oh, yo, I got to talk to you. There's a couple things. There's a couple things I need to talk to you about. He says, you have some. All right? So there are a few people in this church. There are some of you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. If you were, if you were with me week one, you know that Jesus talked to the Ephesian church and says, hey, you guys got the only thing I have with you? Hey, you, you don't have first love. But by the way, you guys hate the teachings of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Man, for Jesus to use that phrase, I hate this, is a big deal. And here, this church, though, is it doesn't hate it. What are they doing? Some are actually promoting something that Jesus hates. Why would Jesus hate what they represent? Well, just to be short, we don't know a lot about the Nicolaitans, but we do know is a few things. Number one, that word Nicolaitan comes from a root word that means to conquer people. So here, there was a group of Christians or a group of people influencing, holding to the teachings of the Nicolaitans that were all about power. Remember, there's no more persecution anymore. None of that. It's all gone. And so now, these, there's, there's this sense of the culture that is now making its way inside of the church where it's like, you know what? They love this sense of now power and opportunity that is available to them. And some even, and this is what I believe was the seed that was planted that became the Roman Catholic Church and during, the middle, uh, during the Middle Ages. You guys know that during the Dark Ages, which we're going to talk about a little next week, regular people could not have the Bible. In fact, the Bible was not written in a language that anyone could understand. It was written in Latin. The pastor would be up here and the, the clergy would preach sermons in Latin. No one understood any of it. They would sing the songs and listen to messages and all of these things, not explain a thing. It was all in a language no one understood. And the people would say, listen, you just need to trust us. We're the special ones here. We're the only ones who can have a connection with God. We're the only ones who understand what this is. Your peasant mind can't even comprehend two words. And so there was this, that essence of power and corruption that made its way eventually in the church. I believe this is where the seed happened with the practice of the Nicolaitans, where people just loved this. And the, the, the Nicolaitans were one that tended to mix a little. They blurred the lines between culture and Christianity and their faith. It was almost having like watered down soda. Listen, look, I don't care. Online, here, I will debate you. I will fight you and argue that there is no better version of Coca-Cola than the ones you get at McDonald's, okay? Just saying. I will fight you for that one, okay? There is Coca-Cola from McDonald's just hits different. It's, there's science to it. I actually found out why. But I'm pretty sure, like you, you've had Coke at some time. You had ice in it. And then you go to sip that delicious soda, and the ice is melted. And I, I can't muscle water down soda. I can't do that. I don't know about you. I can't do that. I'm like, you know what? It's done. I'm over. Listen, that's what happens when you, miss, when you mix the culture, the world with the things of God, you water down your faith and it loses its power. It loses its effectiveness. That's what happens when it blurs in. And so here, that's what the Nicolaitans were all about, blurring the lines. And they were all about power and control, believing in superiority, that there are some who are better than others. Even this was a cultural, a political thing that still exists today, where you have financial and political elites that think that they're smarter and think that they're better, think that you're too dumb to handle freedom. And so you need to be guided and nudged because you would destroy yourself in the process. That's the Nicolaitans. God hates that. But notice there was another dude. Y'all caught Balaam, right? Y'all heard that name. 
Just a heads up, Balaam pops out a lot throughout the scriptures. And so if you ever see Balaam, that's a big deal, all right? I'm not going to go into the details, but in Numbers 25, that's where we see the first part, where Balaam actually helps this Balak, this king, who was intimidated by the Jews as they were leaving Egypt on the way to the promised land. He gets them to tempt them, to corrupt them, because he was afraid, he was intimidated. And so, and Balaam did it, check it out, because a payday came with it. He was like, you know what? I don't care if it hurts them. I know it's going to hurt them. I'm looking out for me. That's Balaam. So there was some in this church who were all, who were holding to the teachings of Balaam. Meaning, what was that? A meaning is they were willing to do things. They compromised on things that they knew was hurting others. And they knew it was wrong because Balaam knew it was wrong, but he wanted the money. He wanted the money. He knew it was wrong. He didn't care who was going to hurt, but he did it anyways. There was some in the church who were acting like that, compromising their values for selfish gain regardless of the ramifications. But also Balaam willingly understood, I am going to create a stumbling block. I'm going to trip up somebody else, but I don't care. I'm doing it all for me. Balaam, two things characterized Balaam, idolatry and sexual immorality. That's what he got the people to do. That's what he was about. Listen, those things are huge. Idolatry is not just getting this little image, putting it up in your corner, and sacrificing chickens to it, all right? That has nothing to do, well, it does, but whatever. That has really nothing to do with idolatry. Idolatry is literally worshiping and caring for and treating anything or anyone as if they were God. At the core, that's what it, I mean, it could be your, look, your purpose, your money, relationships, your job. It can be so many things, your hobbies. It could be anything. We are all searching for a savior in one essence or another. Idolatry is literally treating anything and anyone like God and putting that first as priority. But idolatry, listen, is also the scriptures say it is covetousness. Y'all ever heard that commandment, thou shalt not covet? It's a weird phrase. What does that mean? To covet is greed on steroids. To covet something is like, I want it so bad, and it bothers me that so-and-so has it, and that I don't because I deserve it. Greed, that's, it's extreme greed. Coveting is, I'm not happy until I, who care? I don't care. In fact, ugh, I hate it that that person has it. But coveting is, I just want it. And it's a greed that is never satisfied. It just wants more and more and more and more, and you are never satisfied. That is, coveting is wanting the things of this world to fill the gap in your soul that only God can fill. That's what idolatry is. And sexual morality, you can figure it out, okay? There's, it's not just, it's, it is doing everything and anything that is not in the proper context of sex in a relationship where God created. Listen, sex is a powerful thing that God made. And it is a powerful thing that works best in its, con, you know, in its constrained construct of a marriage between a man born a man and a woman born a woman. It's 2020, I have to say it like that, all right? And so that's what it's for. When it is in that context, it's a powerful thing, just like electricity, guys. Look, right now, you watching me online because of electricity. Everything here is running. This microphone is running on electricity, right? When electricity is contained and, and honed in, it powers the world, doesn't it? It keeps you alive. When it is contained, but right now, if this was exposed, if anything was exposed, if you were exposed to electricity, what would happen? You would die, right? The very thing that keeps us alive can kill you if it is outside of its restraint. That's what sexual immorality does. Listen, God views all sin as sin, but not all sin has the same impact directly in your life. Sexual immorality is one. When you watch things you shouldn't be watching, doing things, feeling things, thinking, all that stuff, that is a out in the proper context, woo, all right, in the proper context. Outside of that, you're dead, all right? It's going to kill you spiritually faster than a lot of other things. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You don't need to live that experience to figure that out. And so that's what Balaam is. So here we have a group of people, a minority in this church, a small group of them, who are now enticed by the things of this world, the power that, that they get, the acceptance now that the world offers, the clout, the, the, the reputation of now that the world gives, the passions, the experience that the world gives. This is what some are compromising on. In reality, though, you know what the three, and I'm going to prove it to you, this whole church is probably dealing with? Pride. Pride. The thing that leads us to say, I'm going to walk away from God and I'm going to do this, is pride. It's you thinking you know better. 
It's you thinking, all right, and you acting and operating as the ultimate authority, and you know what you got yourself figured out. That's pride. Pride leaves you to do some dumb stuff. Fellas, ladies, can I, can, you know, can I get a, woo, oh, yeah, I see my, 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 my guy has done some, I told him not to do that, and yep, look what happened, right? Pride can get us into a lot of trouble. And I want you to check this out. Let me read one verse before we come back and finish this. Look at James chapter 4. Look what, look what James, Jesus' half-little brother, says talking about this, and it's very similar to the message that Jesus is telling this church. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. I'm going to read it all the way through 7. Here we go. You adulterous people. Well, I mean, he ain't, I mean, he, John, James won all the smoke on that one. Look, that term, adulterous people, means that, all right? That he, he is speaking to Christians who, remember, guys, listen, the mystery of marriage, the reason why marriage between a man born a man and a woman born a woman they're the same in essence but different in parts. The reason why that matters and why it matters to us and should matter to Christians is because Paul says it is the mystery of the relationship between God and the bride. That he, we are made in his image. We are the same kind of in essence but different, completely different in parts. And so that is important. And God views our relationship as believers as a marriage covenant. And so if I'm going to call you an adulteress, um, there's a lot of other words that are popping up in my head. I'm not going to say it. Okay, if, if, there's a, you know, if there's another word that says, listen, that means you stepping out. You stepping out on your relationship. So, okay, back to James. Here we go. You adulterous people, what are they doing? Don't you know that, check it out, friendship with the world is hostility towards God. So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says the spirit he made to dwell in us envies us, look at this word, intensely. But he gives grace, he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This person that these Christians that James is talking to is a little bit like the few in Pergamum. They're full of pride. They're full of pride, wanting to do things my way. Notice he says, hey, you think you can hold on to the things of this world and your God at the same time? They're complete opposites. They don't mix. They're complete opposite things. You can't do that. If you choose a side, you automatically put yourself on the other. You can't walk the fence on this one. You can't. And so he's in telling them, look, you cannot be, you cannot want the things of this world and receive the blessings of God at the same time. They are complete opposite. They are opposed to each other. You can't do that. You can't do that. Notice he, when he uses that word adulterous, again, think of that. It is like you, hey, I got a marriage covenant. I got a marriage relationship with you, but I want a girl on the side. I want somebody else on the side. That's what that is. That's why it's such a big deal. And notice he says the spirit inside of him, the spirit inside of us, it, it, it is jealous for us intensely and rightfully so. If you're in a relationship with somebody, you good with them stepping out with somebody else? You good with somebody flirting with them and talking to them and getting the attention? I hope not. Okay, I hope not. All right. And do you think God would put up with anything less? No, he, he loves us and he wants everything and he knows he knows that if you go, if we go to the other side, if we go, then that is going to hurt us. And he loves us too much. And so he wants us. And notice he says there, God will resist the proud. That's what I'm talking about, pride here. If you think you can live your way and determine right from wrong, listen, you won't have a relationship with God. He can't. He's a holy God. He can't mix with sinfulness like that. If we compromise, if we compromise, instead we become proud. And if we compromise, with sexual morality, and we compromise with anything, with the things that we watch, think, say, do, God automatically is like, I can't. And not because he just, because he literally can't. It would make him unholy if he would. But notice what he says, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself. Submit to God and resist the devil. Don't submit yourself to the things of this world because you'll find yourself resisting God and God resisting you. That's not, it's not, it shouldn't work that way. But instead, submit yourself to God, which means humbling yourself. And then you'll be able to resist the devil. And notice he says, cleanse your heart, cleanse your, your hands, sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know what that means? That means you got to own up. So many times we, we, we struggle because we don't want to own up to our sin. We just say, oh, I just kind of made a mistake. Do you guys know that Jesus didn't die because we made mistakes? 
He died because of sin. It's not an oops. Jesus didn't die for an oops, okay? He had to die because of sin. It was a big deal. And so let's look at back at this. So that same attitude of pride, I believe that's what this, this church is dealing with. But not only this, I want you to know what the word Pergamum means. You know what it means? I, th- I can believe this. I'm like, no way. Pergamum actually means married. The, ter- the name of the city means married. So God is having a, a conversation with his bride and saying, hey, look, you know, our relationship is pretty nice. It's good. We're, you know, I, I love, man, you, you do all this for me. I appreciate, I know you love me. But I saw your internet history, though. That's kind of what Jesus is saying. I saw your internet history. I picked up your phone. I saw, that, I saw those messages back and forth that you had with the so-and-so. How did it make you feel? That is what, that's the conversation God is having with Pergamum. He's saying, you guys have gotten yourselves all in an entanglement, all right? Thank you, 2020 and the Smiths, all right, for giving us that word this year, entanglement. That's what this is, Perg- the Pergamum church. There's a few of them who have gotten themselves in an entanglement. And I even looked up the word. What does entanglement mean? A compromising relationship. Man, there it is. A relationship that gets you to compromise or, and you have compromised in order to participate in that relationship. And when we get entangled in this world, we get tangled up in the things of this world. The results, sin, depression, loneliness, frustration. That is what we get when we compromise. We give up the things of God for for this. This church, listen, this was the majority of the church was great. Some of them, some of them were compromising and Jesus was calling them out because he loves them. And here's the thing that you guys need to understand, and I'm going to read this last verse here. Here's the bottom line. When it comes to anything with God, please listen. Please listen. When it comes to anything with God, our compromise leads to our own demise. Our compromise leads to our own demise. When we just say, well, look, everybody's doing it. When we look and say, well, it's not that bad. Even though, well, look, it's just a book. It's just a movie. It's just this. But when you think of it as, oh, it's not that bad, then your guard is down. And it impacts you. It influences you. It's just a song. I know the lyrics are, but it just, it just hits, though. It just, it just hits. Listen, you got to be careful. You got to be careful with the things of this world, the things that what, what, what we are offered. Oh, it's just this. It's just a little. It's not that bad. Listen, that's the things of the, this Pergamum church. Some of them were beginning to be more concerned by being accepted by the world than the world accepting Christ. Do you know how many times you and I, we've, we can compromise and say, you know what? I care more about my friends accepting me than my friends accepting Christ. And you compromise your faith for that. And you do it to your demise and theirs. This is a big deal, guys. You, what we do when we compromise, it it adds to our own demise. So what does Jesus tell this church to do? Check it out. Even though it was small, even though it was a little bit, Jesus has some words. Look at this. Look at 16. Repent then. Repent. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly. And I'm a fight against, I was like, yo, Jesus, Jesus want to pick a fight. He's going to throw hands. All right, listen. Jesus says, repent. Otherwise, I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers, I'm going to give hidden manna. And also, I will give a white stone. And on that stone, a new name inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. I love that. This is not a name that we make for ourselves. This is a name that is given to you by your God. You don't make it. It is given. But hold on. I don't know if you caught some of the language there. Jesus says, I want you to repent. Otherwise, I'm going to go quickly to you and fight them. I'm going to go to you and fight them. Who's the them and who's the you? The them, I think, is this minority church. The small group of them that are compromising their faith. Who are casual in their sin. But, and why would God fight them, again, with that sword? Do you, you guys know who, what else had a double-edged sword during this culture? The Roman consul, the Roman, uh, the, the Roman consul. It was an image. The, the double-edged sword was an image of Rome. So he's saying, uh, are you more afraid of the, the sword of Rome or my sword? It's the fear of God versus the fear of man. And here he's saying, I'm going to bring my word. So what is he going to do? I'm going to convict them. I'm going to go fight, not just with them, but for them, guys. Why would God want to fight them? Because he knows if they are trapped in sin, they are going to, it is to their demise. And if they keep it up, they're going to lead others to down this path. And so God loves us too much that he will fight for his relationship with you. He will fight with you. And I'm telling you, you don't want to be on the other side of this because I've been there. Sometimes 
in order for God to get through to you, he's going to go through you. Watch out when he does. Sometimes in order to get through to you, he'll go through you because he wants you to wake up before it's too late for you and others. But here, here he says, repent. Why should the majority church repent if they're not denying their faith? You know, this is, I was praying about this. God, I don't want us to say this. I believe that they needed to repent of their sin, but the majority had to repent of their silence. I bet you the church, I bet you the majority people knew that some of those people were doing those things and they weren't saying anything. That's why Jesus says, if you don't say, I'm going to go, I'm going to talk to them because apparently you're not doing anything. Guys, you know that God's word says that if we, if we know the right thing to do and don't do it, you know that's also sin. We need to be able to make sure you and I can be compliant, or I'm sorry, you and I can compromise. Not only in sin, we can compromise in silence. If we see a brother and a sister in the faith compromising their sin, do you know that it is your responsibility? It is up to, not up to you, but you are called to go restore that brother, to restore that sister in love, not to let them go down this path, at least without a reminder I love Spurgeon used to always say, listen, if people are going to go to hell, then uh, they're going to go to hell with me wrapped around their ankles because I'm going to make sure that if they're going to go, then I'm going to do at least my best to know that they knew because I told them. Listen, I want you to know that silence can also be sin. And we cannot compromise not only our sin, but our silence. But notice he says that if we listen, we can conquer. What do we get? Jesus says we get bread and stone. I know that looks weird for some of you. I'm like, really? That's, that's, that's bread and a rock with my name on it? That's all I get? Listen, the hidden manna that Jesus talked about was bread from heaven. Here, Jesus is saying, look, what do you want? Do you want to eat and enjoy the things of this world? Or do you want something that's out of this world? Because Jesus said, I am that manna that came down from heaven. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. So look, if you want to go and munch on the things of this world, that will not fill you or satisfy you. But Jesus says, if you're hungry, come to me because I am the bread of life. And those who eat of my words and believe and receive will never be hungry again. So this is something that says, I will satisfy your soul. And that white stone also speaks of access. See, the Pergamum in the culture, if you had a white stone with your name on it, you got access to, like, the library, sporting events, the hospitals that they had there. You, you had access, all right? He says, you will have access to me. If you haven't seen me yet, I've been uh, wearing my little Mickey magic band. I don't know if you've been noticing the little orange thing that I have on my wrist this whole time. Uh, me and my family were pass holders for Disney. And so this, right now, this band is connected to a card in the cloud, okay? It's connected to the card in the cloud. And all I have to do is if I go to the store, if I go to a, you know, a park, and I scan my band, because it's connected to a card in the cloud, I get access to the experience, all right? I get access because it's connected to a card in the cloud. I scan it, I get access to the experience. But not only that, because my band is connected to a card in the cloud, I can go to any restaurant, order what I want, scan the band, and I get food because it's connected to a card in the cloud. Now, I got to pay for it, but, you know, whatever. So you get the idea. This gives me access to food and access to an experience. I believe this is what Jesus was pointing to when he tells that church this. This is what I believe, our modern-day version of it. Listen, if you can resist and you can conquer compromising your sin, if you can humble yourself, Listen, I'm not just going to give you a magic band because in Christ, we don't got magic bands. We got a magnificent bond that is bathed in the blood of Christ. And this is not connected to a card in the cloud. It's connected to our creator in the cloud. And this gives us access to the very throne of God, gives us access to the presence of God. No matter where we are, no matter what has happened, no matter what, it gives us access to him, access to the rivers of living water that, that can quench our thirst, access to the bread of life that, that satisfies our hunger access to the grace and the strength and, and the, the wisdom and all that we need. We have that. We have that in Christ Jesus. That's what we have. And if we compromise, if we compromise our sin for the things of this world, you know what you're doing? It's like me taking my magic band and saying, I'm going to trade my magic band that gives me access to all of that for a pass for Chuck E. Cheese. It's like I'm downgrading from Mickey Mouse to Chuck E. Cheese. Look, I don't care how much pizza and tokens they're going to give me. That's a downgrade. Listen, when we compromise with Christ for the things of this world, it's not, it's not the same. It's not the same. And you know what I love? 
about Jesus' words here. Notice when he says repent. He's talking to his bride. He's talking to his girl. Hey, I love you. I know you love me, but, but I know. I know it's small. I know it's little. But you're stepping out on me. I know. So Jesus' words are repent. You know what he is saying when he says repent? I still want you back. How many of us would reply to somebody like that who was broke our hearts, stepped out on us, even if it was small? For him to say repent is because he is willing and desiring to forgive us because he wants us back. He wants us to return. In Christ alone, no matter how badly we are entangled in the things of this world, his love can untangle us and set us free. Can set us free as long as we repent and turn and call on the name of Jesus. So I want you now to think, If Jesus had to have that talk with you, he was having this talk with me, your prayer this morning should be, Lord, am I compromising in any way? Have I compromised my faith in what I listen to, in my my forms of entertainment? Am I compromising my faith in the way I behave around certain people rather than others? Or what if maybe your, your compromise is your sin? I mean, your silence. Maybe you know somebody's doing something, but you're like, I don't want a problem. I don't want an issue. I I don't want to bring something up, and then now I'm going to, You know, I might lose them as a friend. They might lose their soul. And so may that be our prayer this morning. And if that's you and if you find yourself, guys, right now, and God's convicting you, and we're online here this morning, look, he still says, the the offer is still open. He says, yo, repent and return, come back, and remain in my love. There is nothing that we can do that can out God's love for us. Nothing. He wants us back and he fights for you. And he, if you have to fight with you to, re, to get you back, he will. But because he loves you this much. So remember, guys, whether if you're finding yourself now or someday, our compromise will lead to our own demise when it comes to God. But if we humble ourselves and come to Christ and submit ourselves to him, he will not only receive us, but he promises that by his grace... By his grace, we will be restored. By his grace, we will be received. And by his grace, we will be able to resist and conquer whatever demonic thing that ever comes our way. And so if you find yourself entangled right now, guys, whether now or later, listen, just call on the name of Jesus. Go to the cross. Exchange. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Exchange your misery for his mercy. Exchange your faults for his faithfulness and exchange right now exchange exchange the love of this world for the life-giving heart-healing soul-satisfying love of God